Thank <laughs> you.
Happy Earth Day, everyone. Good evening and welcome to Lightning Talks presented by the Seattle Aquarium. I'm Amy Olson, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a laboratory specialist in the Conservation Programs and Partnerships Department. The Seattle Aquarium is located on the shores of Puget Sound in Washington State, and we honor our location on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples who stewarded these lands and waters for generations and continue to do so today. We're excited to bring you this special edition of Lightning Talks dedicated to sea otters. I'm borrowing the mic from Jim Wharton, our Director of Conservation Engagement and Learning, who typically hosts these events, because this is a part of my capstone project for a graduate certificate in climate science. I'm hoping that you'll help me by actively participating in just a few minutes. If you've never attended a Lightning Talk event, here's what you have in store. We have five awesome speakers and each have five minutes each to share one or two big ideas. They'll get warnings at one minute, 30 seconds, and when they're out of time, they're gonna get this effect. We wanna keep things moving tonight, so we won't stop after each speaker for questions. But if you have any questions or comments, please drop them in the YouTube live chat. And at the end, we're gonna bring all of our speakers back on stage for some Q&A. By stage, I mean screen. If you enjoy what you see tonight and would like to support the Seattle Aquarium, please consider a donation. When you donate to the Seattle Aquarium, you're joining us in our mission of inspiring conservation of our marine environment. So I'd like to get started with four questions to get everyone warmed up. I would really appreciate if you're able to actively participate as this is a part of my capstone project. If you're able, please open up a new tab on your computer, pick up your iPad or iPhone, and go to pollev.com forward slash Amy Olson 433 and answer the following questions. I'll give you a moment to open up a new tab. Again, it's pollev.com forward slash Amy Olson with an E 433. And the link is also posted in the chat. And the first question we have is creating a word cloud. And so if you're able, please share one word that comes to mind when you hear the term climate change. So, so far we have humans, disaster, stress. And as more words pop up onto the screen, it actually creates this really visually stimulating word cloud. So we have melting, pollution, CO2, sea level. I see hope in there, crises. Warming seems to be one of the future, the biggest words as well as future, acidification, urgency. Great. Thank you so much for your participation. I really appreciate it. So let's move on to the next question. Here we have a climate change circle and I'd like you to click on the area of the circle in green where you yourself identify. On the left, we have, I do not believe the climate is changing. On the right, I believe the climate is changing. On the bottom, climate change does not impact my decisions. And on the top, I make decisions based on my impact to climate change. So again, click anywhere on the green circle where you yourself identify.
Okay. Thank you all for participating. My third question is how would you rate your knowledge on climate change in general? And here we have um, a number range from one to 10. One is on the left where you've never heard of climate change before. And on the right, we have a 10 where you consider yourself an expert in climate change. And you can click anywhere on this purple line. I'll give you a moment to fill that out. It looks like we're having some activity. Oh, there we go. Okay, so here's the results. Okay, so it looks like most people align with about halfway through where you're kind of in between of never, or, or you've heard of climate change, but you don't consider yourself an expert. We have a few people that do consider themselves expert, which is great. I love to see the diversity in all of you that are attending tonight. Thank you. Okay, my last question. What is one thing you hope to get out of this experience? Please type in a short sentence, um, a statement, a few statements, something that you really are looking forward to in tonight's event. We have five really great speakers. They're gonna talk to us about sea otters and a lot of different <laughs> we will definitely, we can guarantee that you're going to see some cute otters. I do hope that you learned something new. Knowledge and understanding. Oh yes, we definitely have some fun facts. How to help wild otters, that's great. how climate change has affected otters. Ooh, this one's great. Learning more about jobs in marine science and learning about sea otters, definitely. And learning about how environmental changes have affected sea otters. Yes, thank you all so much for participating. Okay, so we have such a great lineup with an amazing range of speakers. So let's get started. I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Sean Larson, our Curator of Conservation Research. Hi, Sean. Hi, Amy, how are you tonight? I'm doing great, thanks for joining us. Of course. Um, Dr. Sean Larson is the Curator of Conservation Research for the Department of Conservation Programs and Partnerships at the Seattle Aquarium. <laughs> She has led the aquarium's research program for 26 years and has studied sea otters since the beginning, focusing first on genetics and endocrinology, and in the past decade, focusing more on ecosystem-wide studies of sea otters and their impacts on the near shore from population status assessments to documenting diet changes and ecosystem functioning. Now, Sean, are you ready to share some fun things about sea otters with us? I am ready to share. Thank you, Amy. All right. Please go ahead. Okay. Hopefully you guys can see my uh, PowerPoint. There we go. Great. Okay. Thanks for that great introduction, Amy. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about my favorite subject, sea otters, and why are they are so great. Specifically, I'd like to touch base on their uniqueness as a marine mammal and their history. Uh, their role as a keystone species in the ecosystem and their role in climate resilience. So if I was asked to describe sea otters in a few words, the first word I would use is unique. They are the largest of the mustelids or the weasel family in which they are classified, and they're the largest of the otters by weight, but they're the smallest marine mammal, and they are the only marine mammal without a blubber layer to stay warm in the cold waters in which they live. So how do they stay warm? where sea otters have a superpower, and that is the densest fur of the animal kingdom, up to a million hairs per square inch in some parts of their body. Basically, it's so dense that they're able to trap a layer of air um, in their fur next to their skin so that cold water never touches their skin. But even though they have this incredibly thick fur in these cold waters, they still lose heat to the environment. So they have another way to stay warm. 
they eat a lot. They have one of the highest metabolic rates for animals their size, they eat 25 to 40% of their body weight every day. And for these otters off the Washington coast that are 60 to 80 pounds, that's 20 to 30 pounds of food every day. So a little bit about their unique history uh, with people. Uh, this is a, a range map of sea otters throughout the North Pacific. And the purple color is their historic range where they used to live. And the yellow color overlaid is their current range. And you might ask, well, why is there purple colors there? And that's because of that superpower of the super dense fur. They were almost hunted to extinction for their luxurious fur during the international maritime fur trade from the 1700s to the early 1900s, resulting in a loss of 99% of the sea otters in the world. And the ones that remained are indicated by these red stars. So you might ask, well, why do we have sea otters in this area? And that is because of successful translocations during the 1960s and 70s, as indicated by these green stars, and is the reason why. So those animals were moved from those remnant areas to these areas where sea otters used to occur. And that's why we have sea otters in Southeast Alaska, British Columbia, and Washington State. And those otters account for 30% of the animals alive today. So the second word I'd use to describe sea otters is keystone species. Well, what's a keystone? A keystone is a stone in the middle of an arch that holds the whole structure together. Well, sea otters, when they occur in the environment, tend to stabilize and hold the whole ecosystem together. So here is a picture of a kelp forest ecosystem with sea otters. You see beautiful kelp plants, you see a lot of different fish, and there's a lot of different invertebrates in there as well. And then this is an ecosystem without sea otters and you see fewer kelp plants and a, a lot of one type of benthic invertebrate and this, these are urchins and this is called an urchin barren. So basically with sea otters, you have a more complex, complete ecosystem and without you have a less complex and complete ecosystem. And then the third word I'd like to use to describe them is essential. And it's becoming more and more apparent that these keystone species are essential in providing climate resilience or preventing climate change in these nearshore ecosystems. There's been work done about the, in the last decade that really is shedding light to this. Specifically, Wilmers et al. in 2012 looked at the amount of carbon that is held in ecosystems with sea otters and without. And we know that more carbon in the atmosphere can drive climate change. So here is a picture of an ecosystem with a sea otter and with kelp. And here's a picture of one without a sea otter and an urchin barren. And what they found was these systems with sea otters can keep kelp in the ecosystem and out of the atmosphere 10 to 1,000 times more than those systems without sea otters. There's newer research by Rasher et al. 2020 that my colleagues will touch on. And that just showed that with um, warming oceans and oceans becoming more acidic, those areas that have sea otters tend to show decrease changes in the ecosystem or climate resilience than those areas that don't have sea otters. And there's new research being proposed to tease this and uh, more things to be learned about it. And I have learned so much from the years of studying sea otters and we're starting to learn more and more about their role in preventing climate change and providing climate resilience. And we hope that that will then inform our understanding of other ecosystems that have other apex predators and keystone species like bears, sharks, and wolves. Thank you very much. That was perfect timing, Sean. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for giving us that introduction to sea otters. And we're really excited to learn more about how sea otters um, can hold carbon in the environment. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so Sean, we'll be back at the very end for our question and answers. So please feel free to, free to drop your questions into the chat. Our next speaker is Zachary Randall. Hi, Zach. Hello, Amy. Hello. Zachary is a six year PhD candidate finishing his dissertation at the Oregon State University. His background is in scientific diving, particularly in cold water kelp forest systems. His work involves quantitative and theoretical ecology surrounding the mechanisms driving shifts between kelp forests and urchin barrens. He is currently a special projects volunteer for the Seattle Aquarium research team. And are you ready for us? I am ready to go. All right, please take it away. Okay, thanks, Amy. 
All right, hello folks. Well, I'm excited to talk to you all today about the idea that sea otters may be able to mitigate some of the negative effects of climate change. Now, as Sean provided in her introduction, when sea otters are absent, sea urchins tend to overgraze and consume a lot of kelp, so much so that the system can shift to an urchin barren where kelp is not able to grow. And when sea otters are present, they eat the urchins and thereby indirectly allow the kelp to thrive and all the other species associated with kelp. So what does this have to do with climate change? Well, sea otters are not gonna be able to affect the strength or creation of a climate event, such as a anomalous warm water event, but they may be able to mitigate some of the negative effects of that event. For example, as Sean alluded to, uh, there's recent research from Rasher et al. that in the Aleutian Archipelago, a warm water event increased the rate at which sea urchins grazed upon hard algae, encrusting algae, and increased ocean acidification weakened the structure of this algae, making it more susceptible to urchin grazing. So the combination of those two environmental variables channeled through sea urchin grazing just wiped out the seafloor here. And the authors argued, had sea otters been present, they may have been able to mitigate some of that. Another example, you may recall the anomalous warm water event known as the blob that took place along the Northeast Pacific coast starting in around 2013 or so. We can see years down here on the x-axis. And so this is sea surface temperature. So you can see this spike, the water got really warm and what happened is the sea stars, they all got diseased and melted. We don't fully understand what happened there, but there was massive loss. Sea urchins rose in abundance and established urchin barrens. And abalone, when kelp was gone, they, they starved. Now, curiously, sea urchins don't starve, but that's a different conversation. Again here, this is Northern California. Had sea otters been present, they may have been able to mitigate some of that rise in urchin barrens. Now lastly, we don't necessarily know exactly how sea otters affect the, the benthos, the life in the seafloor on the bottom of the ocean, but we do, we are starting to gather some indications. Uh, for example, researchers with the Seattle Aquarium have been conducting video surveys of the seafloor. And uh, you see here imagery from 2011 and 2018. 2011, the seafloor is thriving. There's lots of sponges and sea stars and algae. And after the warm water event, where the sea urchins rose, they actively grazed everything down, including other invertebrates. And this is the same rock. So you can kind of see the outline of the rock under all of these sponges here. That's the same rock and it is completely scoured clean. Now there aren't any otters here, but there is one location where sea otters are present that these surveys take place. And at that location, it's hard to see, the image is a bit grainy, but the ecosystem hasn't experienced that same dramatic change. So it's possible here that sea otters are indeed increasing the resilience of the local community. And so this is an active area of research and we will be finding more about this in the coming years. And so with that, folks, thank you very much. I appreciate you listening in. Thank you very much, Zachary. Really, really cool photos, really beautiful photos, and really cool to hear more about that. And don't forget to drop your questions for Zach in the chat, in the YouTube live chat. We'll bring him back at the very end, so we'll see you soon. All right. Our next speaker is Isabel Grock. Isabel? Hello. Hi, Amy. Hello. How Hello. are you? Welcome. I'm doing well. Isabel is an award-winning writer, photographer, and documentary filmmaker and book author with a focus on wildlife conservation and the relationships between people and the natural world. With degrees in journalism from Columbia University and urban planning from MIT, Isabel aims to document the impacts of human activities on threatened species and habitats. And she is the author of the book, Sea Otters, A Survival Story. 
Now, Isabella, are you ready to share your screen? I am ready, Amy. All right, it looks great. And please go ahead. Thanks, Amy. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here tonight to share a few thoughts about my approach to visual storytelling for sea otter education. I photographed my first sea otter in Alaska 13 years ago, and I confess I immediately fell in love. I started learning about the sea otter's journey from near extinction to their return on the landscape. And as a journalist, I wrote several stories about them over the years. I became fascinated with sea otters and I took every opportunity to photograph them in the field. However, over time, I came to understand that these close-up photos of these adorable sea otters were not telling their full story. Sea otters are more than a cute face. They have a multi-dimensional story. They're a keystone species having a large influence on the ecosystem and on local communities when they return to a landscape. However, when it comes to photographing sea otters and wildlife in general, many of us photographers naturally tend to want to capture close-up shots of species looking straight at us. We want to create a connection with our subject, and when we focus so much on the eyes, well, the background can sometimes almost become irrelevant. It so happens that those wildlife portraits are the ones that are often the most popular on social media and in magazines. For example, in this image that you see on the screen, I included a bit of the kelp that is so important for sea otters, but the final image that make it to the cover of this magazine has been reframed to be just the portrait of the sea otters and you don't see uh, the kelp so much anymore. So what's the problem with this approach? Those close-up images get people's immediate attention, but they do not always help towards long-term conservation goal. Why? One reason is that when people see images that show species being separated from their natural context, they can sometimes forget those complex ecosystem interactions that support the survival of species in the wild. Yet species do not exist in isolation. They are part of a larger habitat and this is what ultimately ensures their long-term survival. So I realized that if I wanted to effectively communicate the full story of the sea otters, I needed to change my approach and find ways to visually reconnect these animals to their environment and show the big picture. So how did I do that? I started with documenting sea otters' big appetite since this is the foundation of their role as a keystone species. In this image, you see a sea otter holding a clam, and you also notice those big whiskers. What does that remind you of? I personally think of the Sundance skit, but I don't think Robert Redford has such a big influence on the ecosystem. Sea otters eat all sorts of shellfish, including crab. So I got those photos, but these guys also eat crab, but this is a river otter and river otters do not have such a big influence on the ecosystem as a keystone species. So as you can guess, that's not enough to tell the story. So I spent a lot of time thinking about this and I took many trips over 10 years to gain more depth into that story. I worked closely with scientists, following them in the field, and this science-based approach was a critical part of being able to capture those multiple dimensions. Some of the things I wanted to show was the relationship between the sea otter's appetite and the renewal of kelp forest. I wanted to show how kelp in turn supports so many species, including on land, how people rely on kelp for their livelihoods, how researchers continue to learn today about ecosystem relationships. As sea otters moved into an estuary in California, I was able to take that ecosystem approach to show how sea otters taste for crab has an impact on the health of seagrass. And I even show how this very important species called the California sea hare works with sea otters to help seagrass. Why does this matter? This approach reminds us that this is not just about one charismatic species, but all about the different parts of the ecosystem, including the smaller species that play a role. I was able to work recently with the group Sea Otter Savvy on this big picture approach to educate other wildlife photographers to move about the value of moving away from those straight face shots to focusing on sea otters within their context. And of course, as photographers, we can still capture those beautiful portraits. And But as visual storytellers, what matters is showing the context. Here, kelp, 
And this is what I have for you tonight. Thank you very much. That was perfect, Isabel. Thank you so much. I love the idea of reconnecting animals back to their environment and putting them back in context instead of just looking at them by themselves. I love that idea. So if you have any questions for Isabel, please put them in the YouTube live chat. We will bring them all back um, at the very end of the program and we're gonna pull questions from you. So please put every single sea otter question that comes to your mind in the chat and we'll compile them for the very end. Thank you, Isabel. Okay, so let's take it away for our next speaker, John. Hello, John. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. John is the Director of Science and Policy with the Alaka Alliance. He is a conservation biologist with experience in a wide array of disciplines, including conservation planning, wildlife policy, wildlife monitoring, habitat restoration, captive wildlife husbandry, and natural history interpretation. It sounds like you wear many, many hats. I have indeed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now are you ready to share your screen with us? I, I should be there, yep. It looks great. All right, please go ahead. Okay, well, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about the Alaka Alliance and our plans and how this relates to some of the themes that you're discussing today. Our, the Alaka Alliance, is based on the word alaka, which is the Chinook trade jargon, meaning sea otter. And our mission is to restore a healthy population of sea otters to the Oregon coast and in the process, help make Oregon's marine ecosystem more robust and resilient. And we know that, you know, of course, sea otters have a long legacy in, in Oregon. There's a long cultural heritage connection to the Oregon coast tribes and, and the coast tribes all have words for sea otter. And here are some of those words in addition to alaka. And we also know from the, the archaeological digs of tribal midden sites and others that, that sea otters were regularly utilized and, and uh, so sea otter bones and remains were found in these midden sites as a very common item. But, you know, others have talked about this and, and we'll talk about this, but the, the legacy of the fur trading from Russians and, and Euro-Americans and British and others left uh, a sort of a West Coast with no sea otters. And we've had some translocation efforts in Washington and the Puget Sound as other, as uh, as uh, Sean had discussed. And there's been a recovery in Southeast, a reduction in Southeast Alaska and a recovery in the Aleutian Islands and a, a population growth of that small population in, in Central California. But there's this 800 mile gap from Northern California through the entire state of Oregon and most of Washington, uh, Southern and Central coast of Washington. And so in that range, we've lost this redundancy. We've lost a key predator of the marine intertidal zone that that eats sea urchins and other uh, herbivores, other kelp herbivores, and also some of the creatures that um, they also eat things like crabs, which which as a result, they have a beneficial effect on, on eelgrass. But there's another predator called the sunflower sea star, which has a similar role in each sea urchins. And uh, so having diverse predators in an ecosystem is really important. But as you may have heard, the sunflower sea star, and like a lot of sea stars, underwent a, a large population collapse, almost an unprecedented collapse. Uh, and they were noted to be critically endangered by the International Union of, Con of the Conservation of Nature. And this is thought to be related to ocean warming trends. The 2014 was a huge event in marine biology and marine, marine, marine conservation with a large uh, increase, large ocean blob and a big dramatic increase in high water temperature extremes. And it appears that that's probably connected to the sunflower sea star collapse. And so we've had this shifting ecosystem. Now we're in an ecosystem with no sunflower sea stars and no sea otters. And this is a pretty unprecedented issue because now there's really nothing there to control sea urchins. And here's an example of a before and after shot in Port Orford, Oregon. The, the, the shot on your left is, is a bull kelp area. And then the shot on the right is a few years later with uh, almost all the bull kelp removed by urchins. And so what many of the other speakers have talked to about is that what we know about sea otters is that when sea otters are present, there's more kelp kelp forests flourish and kelp is of course extremely important for, for ocean biodiversity and productivity. And, but also kelp's really important as a, as a source of carbon storage. And so that's a dramatic service or an ecological service that kelp provides with respect to climate change. 
And so we can look at sea otters as a mechanism for climate resilience. And we think that in addition to their you know, ecological benefits to fisheries and, and improving fisheries, improving kelp habitat. And uh, we also recognize that we're reestablishing a, a vital, important uh, cultural connection since time immemorial that the tribes, I think, uh, you know, are very interested in. And, and so we, we support that value in addition to the ecological values and conservation values. So our objectives going forward is to try to assess if this is going to work, if it's possible, how will it work, if there are any concerns, any issues, pros and cons, to help the region form a consensus, and if warranted, proceed with restoration. And so that's really our plan, and uh, we look forward to, you know, hope to have your support. And here's a little bit about us and our website and uh, social media links, YouTube channel out there. And we'll look forward to any questions if you have them later. Thank you so much, John. So it sounds like you're saying that sea otters can eat their way to save the world. Yeah, exactly. Urchin, <laughs> urchin uni is a, is a tasty thing, and, and it's a, it could be a mechanism for some ecosystem change. Awesome. Sign me up. <laughs> so everyone, if you have questions for John, please type them in the YouTube live chat. We'll bring him back at the very end for our Q&A session. Thank you so much. Okay, and last but not least, our final speaker is Lynn Lee. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Welcome, Lynn. Um, hello. Lynn's, hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? I can't hear you if you're talking. I am. Yes, okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So we're, uh, we have a little bit of a challenge with technology and my computer. And I think Glida is going to show the slides. Is that correct? That um, is correct. I don't see the slides myself. That's will okay. I be able to? Yes. Oh, no. But will you? can you hear me? Just to make sure you can hear me. I can't hear you at all. Oh, cannot. Hello. Can you try again? Hello. Oh, no, I can't hear you. Oh, technology. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just go ahead and share. I can see the All chat. All right. We'll jump right in. And I'm going to turn off my camera while I talk because I am uh, here from Haida Gwaii and my bandwidth is limited, so I'll come back uh, later. Okay. I can see the screen now, but I can't seem to stop my camera. So, um, Oh, there we go. All right, so <laughs> thanks everyone. Um, that uh, really a great presentations. And so I'm gonna talk to you now a little side tangent about many of the things that you've just heard about and wrapping it up in a kelp forest restoration talk. So uh, I am up on Haida Gwaii and um, at Guayanas National Park Reserve, National Marine Conservation Area Reserve and Haida Heritage Site. And we're working on a project called Chihu Til Inas Dal, Nurturing Seafood to Grow in Guayanas. Um, I am the technical lead, next slide or click, I'm just gonna say, um, but you'll see that I am really just the talking head. And so re I'm representing a huge project team, very collaborative, um, involving all the management partners for Guayanas, Fisheries and Oceans, Parks Canada, and the Haida Nation, uh, all working together with the fishing industry uh, for academic institutions, um, the Hakai Institute, and also um, lots of communication folks. And so you can see one uh, summer's field crew here, go to the next slide. And here we have um, a list of all the people, plus many more that are working to make this happen. So thank you to them all. Next slide. Um, what's special about our situation, uh, aside from this collaboration, is that the Guayanas area is uh, cooperatively, cooperatively managed by the Archipelago Management Board, click again. Um, and you'll see there are six people on this board, half Haida, so three from the Haida Nation, two from Parks Canada, and one from Fisheries and Oceans. So this protected area in Northern BC is um, cooperative, cooperatively managed. Next slide. Um, and so we're transforming urchin barrens into kelp forests with this project. Click again. And this is because of culturally and ecologically important species. And this is for people and for place. Click. Um, as one example, 
sorry, this is awkward. Uh, it, so what's important about kelp, as you've heard, is that it's habitat and it's also shelter from many different species. And so it would be like us living in a gingerbread house where uh, you could eat the house that you live in as well as have it provide your shelter. And so bigger kelp forests are better for the species that depend on them. Click again. Um, and herring and herring eggs. I actually just came off a boat today looking, uh, serving herring spawn, but they feed the big, like the whale on top and also the small, like the little snails. And so herring and herring eggs feed many, many different species and are critical to the ecosystem. Click again. Um, and they're also critical to people. So gao, uh, as it's called in Haida or herring roe on kelp is also critically important to communities and culture. Click again. Um, I didn't have time on the boat to get to the internet, but you also love kelp. Why you should love it, it's in your sushi, it's in all kinds of food that we eat, um, ice cream, chocolate milk, so all uh, in shampoo, cosmetics, paint, all sorts of things that you use every day have kelp and kelp products in them. So it's important for all kinds of things. Click again, including your beer and gin <laughs> from British Columbia. This is locally harvested kelp in a local brew and um, a local gin from Vancouver Island. Click again. And as you've heard, there's also this link to climate change. So they can, kelp is good for resilience to climate change, increasing all of these shoreline protection, uh, carbon cycling, local dissolved oxygen, and also decreasing local acidification. Click again. So spoil alert here, uh, we made it happen, a short little video to show the urchin barrens that were in Guayanas in this section of coastline before we did the work. And then this is what it looked like the year after, although it looks like my video, there we go. Um, and so you can see that in it, less than a year, there was this huge recovery of the annuals, kelps. Click again. Um, and of course, this is where sea otters come in. And so as you've just heard from many different speakers, they're missing as the keystone species in the ecosystem, click. Um, and if you were a 150 pound person and you ate like a coo, which is sea otter in Haida, you would eat up to 50 pounds of shellfish every day. So that is a lot of food, click. Um, and urchins are one of the things that they eat when they first move into an area, click. And these little urchins, if you click again, if you flip one of these little guys over, they have this jaw that's very good at grazing kelp. So click again. Um, and so they can graze down kelp forests in very short order. Click and turn kelp forests into urchin barrens like this one on Haida Gwaii and click again. Um, and sometimes they can get to be super numerous like this purple urchin barren, click again. Um, and one thing to know is that, uh, as John has mentioned, sea otter hunting and shellfish harvesting by coastal First Nations has occurred for millennia as found in midden sites. Click again. Um, but in less than 50 years, we in the maritime fur trade of the early um, late 1700s, early 1800s, decimated uh, almost all the, po the population uh, along their range and entirely throughout BC. Um, so click. And by 1877, uh, George Dawson noted on in Haida Gwaii that below high water mark in some places, the larger trends were thickly strewn over the bottom. Click again. My mic is, oh, can you guys hear me again? Sorry, we, I don't know what happened there. You. Well, you ran out of anyway, time. I will keep going, but I can't hear anything. Um, so in areas where sea otters go, have come back, then can... <laughs> Sorry, Lynn, we're having some technical difficulties um, with her, but she did run out of time, unfortunately. Um, if you have any questions for Lynn, please drop them in the YouTube live chat. This is your opportunity to get all of your sea otter questions answered. Um, so right now we're gonna bring everyone back onto the screen and we're gonna start our Q&A session. Welcome back, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your wonderful um, five minute speeches. Sorry, I'm getting some feedback here. And we're gonna start our question and answer session. And Sean, I think I wanna start with you. Um, a question that came up in the chat is, where can I see sea otters if I'm in Washington? 
That is a great question. So um, sea otters occur on the outer Washington coast, not so much in Puget Sound. So if you're in Washington State, if you're in Seattle, you're going to have to get on a ferry and, get, and go west. And it's about a three hour drive to the outer coast. And the northern part of the sea otters range on the outer west Washington coast is pretty remote. In other words, you can you can drive to a, um, the Ozette Ranger Station and then you have to hike in three miles to actually reach the outer coast. It's a beautiful hike and it's beautiful once you get there, but, um, and there's usually anywhere from 20 to 80 sea otters at that point, at that place. But if you just would like to um, pull over in your car, you would have to go to an area called Claylock because that's the area along the Washington coast where um, Highway 101 actually goes right next to the ocean and there's a lot of sea otters out there too this is an area that is more sandy bottom so at times there might be rafts of sea otters anywhere from 80 to 100 individuals i've seen up to 2,000 otters there at one point but um, usually they're in groups of anywhere from one to ten so if you want to hike i'd say go to the ozette ranger station and hike out to sandpoint and if you don't want to hike just drive your car along highway 101 and hit the claylock area what about if you're in the city of Seattle? If you're in the city of Seattle, there are um, three beautiful sea otters at the Seattle Aquarium and you can go see them there. <laughs> Perfect. All right, my next question is gonna be for Zach. Zach, can you define what resilience means? Yeah, that's a good question. And the answer somewhat depends on who you ask, but roughly a resilient system is one that when it's perturbed somehow, when it's when it's disturbed, so from a warm water event, a large wave event, something happens to it, it's disrupted, it's then able to recover. So a resilient system will recover really quickly back to its original condition and a less resilient or not resilient system will get perturbed and stay in that disrupted state. Great, thank you. I think that really clarifies um, what climate resilience can mean. Thank you. Um, my next question is for Isabel. Isabel, do you have any advice for beginner wildlife photographers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would uh, encourage anyone who's interested in wildlife to start locally to find a place, a conservation issue, or a species that live close to your home and spend time documenting it. Um, and you'll, you'll see how much you learn and discover about the species. And it's very, very satisfying to, to start there and build a story about that partic particular species. I find that repetition is a key, knowing, becoming immersed in that species, and you'll get uh, great photos and building your visual storytelling skills. That's great advice. I know I just um, use my phone to take photos, but um, I think practice makes perfect, definitely. Okay, John, this question is for you. Um, from a consumer or newbie activist perspective, is there anything that one can do to help promote healthy key kelp forests and to help sea otters thrive in their environment? Yeah, I think before, you know, what I mentioned the obvious that that to try to support conservation measures like reintroductions of sea otters uh, to, you know, places where they're not currently, that's uh, kind of an obvious one. But the, the not so obvious one is to look at, consider exploring and supporting some of these new markets that are emerging that say for the sale of the uni, the, the row from purple sea urchins. And this is a kind of a new thing in, in California. There's a project being developed in Oregon uh, where purple sea urchins, which are the more kind of native, but sort of invasive in this case, uh, you know, expanding urchin barons, or a lot of these are purples, is to consider so trying to support those markets, and 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 I think that that developing a market for purple sea urchins might be a really a really uh, valuable tool in the future. Great, thank you. Let's see. Oh, there's so many good questions here. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Zach, could you explain more about urchins not starving or not needing to eat? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So you may be familiar with metabolism. You take in food and then you burn it for energy. You expend that energy. Sea otters are able to ramp down their metabolism. They're able to really decrease it and their insides actually shrinks quite a bit. So they slow down significantly. And it's not so much that they're not eating anything, they're able to survive by basically scraping what is present on the seafloor. And there may not be any kelp around, they may have eaten that already, but there's kind of some scuzz, kind of like moss, but on the ocean floor, yeah. and they can, they can survive by just scraping what little is there. And it's, it is difficult for uh, the restoration of urchin barrens, the fact that they do not starve easily. So it sounds like sea otters can eat their way to helping with mitigating climate change and urchins have the ultimate diet perspective. So I guess I would prefer to be a sea otter if I had to choose between the two. Um, let's see. Sean, why do you study sea otters? Um, well, I started studying sea otters because I was interested in uh, their reproductive physiology. And um, at that time in the, in the 1990s, um, sea otters weren't readily bred in captivity. And so I was kind of wondering why. Um, and the Seattle Aquarium was one of the few aquariums that had success in breeding sea otters. So I started studying them by looking at collecting their poop and actually looking at uh, hormones that could allow them to become pregnant. And, and, and give birth. And so that just, what I found was that sea otters are unique um, from other weasels, or the mustelids and the family in which they live, they were also unique compared to other otters. So that just started, just piqued my interest. And I started looking at their genetics and their diversity after the fur trade and, you know, losing 99% of their numbers, what is their genetics? Started looking at that. And then I started really about 10 years ago being interested in their role in Washington's ecosystem because when I started um, helping with the surveys um, in the early 2000s there were only about 500 sea otters off our Washington coast and now we have 3,000 so I started really looking at how as the otters expanded in their numbers and their range what their effect was on the ecosystem what they were eating etc and now with this new research coming out it's showing that with these wonderful, gorgeous creatures in a system, they could really stop or lessen climate change. I'm just, I'm done, you know, I'm like, wow, this is sea otters are just the best. So uh, <laughs> we're starting new research to actually look deeper into that climate change uh, question with sea otters with Zach and, and other folks. And we're just so excited about it. And I'm just, everything about sea otters are unique. So I'm just, yeah, I, I don't know if I answered it's your question. <laughs> you did. I mean, it's obvious. It's obvious that you're passionate, and I think we'll yes. find that a lot of our viewers are also very passionate as well. Um, okay, so my last question is to everyone, and I'm trying to find it. Okay, what can anyone do to help sea otters? I know this is a big, big question. What's something that someone can do to help sea otters? Amy, maybe you should pick somebody to start. <laughs> okay, let's start with um, Isabel. Well, I think uh, how what can you do to help sea otters? I think the, what we should see tonight in those presentations is that the interconnections of our ecosystems and how how everything is is connected. So when you remove a species like the the sea otter. You, you lose so much. So I think being, they remind us that what we do in our daily lives has an impact on all these parts of the ecosystem. So I think um, being mindful of our activities on land, what we do, knowing that it impacts the ocean and sea otters and all these creatures is something where we can start, even if we live in an area where we're not close physically to sea otters. Great answer. Does anyone want to follow up with Isabel's comment, John? Sure. Um, yeah, I would. I would. One quick observation about you know conservation work is that a lot of times the people that come to the table are the ones that are most concerned about negative impacts to their interests. 
And so when we think about an issue like proposing sea otter reintroduction, a lot of the people that might come to the table and be vocal are concerned about maybe the negative consequences it might have to, to shell, commercial shellfish fisheries. But the people that might think that it's okay, like fin fi recreational fin fish, commercial fin fish, or let's say tribe, you know, tribal nations maybe, or uh, surfers or uh, free divers, that they might not be as motivated to come to the table and to voice their support for sea otter reintroduction. So I would say uh, a great way to help is to take part in the public process and, and mention it to decision makers, legislators, to, to comment yourself and to be a part of the voice of support uh, for a plan to reintroduce sea otters. I think that's great advice. I know a lot of people might feel that contacting their legislators um, can be a little intimidating or scary, but they are very open, um, I've found, um, to listen to your concerns and actually sending them an email or even a phone call can be actually a lot easier than you think. And I think it's important to let them know how we feel and what values we hold and what makes us um, excited and what we're passionate about. So I definitely agree, John. Um, Zachary, do you have anything else to add? I, I think what was said articulated it very well, getting involved with the nonprofits and the conservation entities actively involved in sea otter conservation is probably one of the primary ways you can support sea otters, actively supporting their conservation and the entities that do that work. Great, and last but not least, Sean? <laughs> yeah, I would just wanna add that um, every person can help and sea otters need clean water in which to live and plenty of food. So um, not polluting uh, the marine environment is very important. And also um, if, when you're out recreating on the water and you see sea otters um, to please give them plenty of space because they are easily disturbed and they they need to use a lot of energy to uh, maintain their their body heat and take care of their pups especially so respect the nap you know give them a lot of, of room and and don't uh, get too close even though it's really tempting because they're awfully cute so that's my two cents perfect now i want to um thank each and every one of you, including Lynn, um, who's continuing to have some technical difficulties um, for your time, your insight, your expertise. Um, you can imagine that everyone is uh, applauding and giving you a standing ovation from home. And that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you so much. Now, if you remember those questions you answered in the beginning of the program, I'd like to end the program with two final questions to gauge the effectiveness of our program. I would appreciate if you're able to, again, go to the same link as before. So it's pollev.com forward slash Amy Olson with an E 433 and answer just two questions before you leave. I know it's time for dinner. I know it's time to put the kids to bed, but if you could just do this very quickly, I would really, really appreciate it as this is a part of my capstone project. So the first question is, how much has your knowledge of climate change changed tonight? And the values go from one to 10, and on the left is a one where you don't think that you learned anything, and a 10 on the right is where you learned a lot this evening. So based on your knowledge from where the program started, how much has your knowledge changed? And I will give you a moment to click anywhere on the purple line there. Okay. And my next question and last question, it is one, one, what is one thing that you've learned today? Excuse me. One thing that you learned today. I hope this is working. I'm not seeing any comments yet. It could be a short statement or a few statements of something that you've learned today.
and I'm still not seeing anything. And maybe the technology energies of the world have decided that this is the end of our program. If you are able to enter, please continue entering your statements of something that you've learned. Um, this will all go into my final report for my project. Okay. Good evening. Thanks again to our speakers. You are all amazing. And if you enjoyed tonight's free science event, please consider a donation to keep programs like these happening. And if you're local, come see us. The aquarium is open at reduced capacity with time ticketing, a one-way flow, and a strong emphasis on staff and visitor safety. We have two free virtual events coming up. Join us on May 22nd for Sea Change, an event all about celebrating ocean conservation featuring photojournalist Christina Mittermeier. And our next Lightning Talk event will be focused on orcas as a part of Orca Action Month on June 17th. Thank you all so much for joining us and have a great evening. Happy Earth Day.